Hello, this is the demo of the Pulse Lab Shop software. For, um, rather than open the program directly, I'll open this template here, which um, is called Lab 2 Modal Shaker, based on Pulse's Modal Shaker template. So we'll open that up, and um, let me show you how the Pulse software is laid out. Um, first, um, You'll notice this bar on the left. As you work through a project, you'll flow um, down these tabs, and then there you can uh, click down here to open up the next tab, and the next set of tabs, and so on. So the flow is from top to bottom over here. Standard menus and things on top. The other thing I'll point out is that um, the template hides a lot of the software options to make things simpler for you. But if you ever need to access the, all of the options, we can click this button here, that opens up the full Pulse um, Lab Shop, and you get extra buttons. And these menus, we'll see, you'll see, will be larger now um, with all of every possible option shown. Okay, but for now we don't need that. Um, so now let's look at how we go through this lab. Um, the first thing to do is um, the look at is the project information. Nothing we really need here, so we can go right to hardware setup. Now, um, in general, you'll have to um, set up your hardware, um, and the way you do that um, is through the front-end setup. So, um, thanks to Windows 7's lovely new um, interface, you, there's virtually no hope of navigating to this, but we know that it's called front-end, so um, we type in front, and the couple things down, we see front-end setup, and something that looks like a data acquisition box and the icon. Okay, so if we open that up, what we'll see is um, there's a device that we're connected to. And you can see the IP address. That same IP address will show up on the digital screen on the front of the LAN XI. Now, typically, it won't be connected, or you might be connected to the wrong device. So what you'll need to do is you'll need to remove this device and then hit Browse Devices. Um, Find the one you want. There might be a full list of all the possible devices that you could choose from. You can identify them by the IP address. Click Add. Um, it will establish the connection, and away you go. The thing I'll point out, if you don't delete this device, um, the software will crash. Um, we only have a license to connect to one device at a time, so you need to clear out any devices before trying to connect to another one. Well, once all that's done, I can apply that configuration, close this down, and now we're ready to, to tell the software we're connected to the hardware. Why don't you talk to it and um, establish that initial connection? So you might have noticed some yellow lights um, light up on the front of the hardware as it um, identifies which module it's connected to and looks to see what sensors are there. None of our sensors will read in automatically, so we'll need to do that manually here. So the way we can do that, um, the first, um, let me show you the setup here in the video. Um, this first channel is connected to an accelerometer on the first card. Um, this second channel is connected to an, um, an accelerometer back here on the second card. And then um, on the Oops, this is wrong. On um, the first output is um, we've split the signal. We'll send that signal back in as the third input. So the third channel will be the fourth. It'll just measure the voltage output and treat that as a fourth. And then we'll split that signal and send it also to this amplifier back here. And that amplifier will amplify the output signal and use it to drive the motor that will cause um, these masses to move. Okay, so now we need to um, tell the software what sensors we have connected to each channel. Um, so the first um, sensor is an accelerometer, um, and then we need to choose the type from the drag-down menu. Um, so the accelerometer I know is a Kistler, it's this one at the bottom, and its serial number is uh, the first one on the list. And then it will automatically fill in everything after that. Okay, so a similar procedure for the second channel. Um, it's the same type of Kistler accelerometer, and I'll choose the serial number. 
Um, now, I'll also mention if you did need to add a sensor, and you shouldn't do this without the help of a TA, but you can um, right click over here and go to the transducer database, and up comes a window that lets you add sensors. Um, but uh, the one trick here is if you, um, some sensors are powered, and if you were to accidentally send power to a non powered sensor, you could damage it. So um, don't do that without uh, checking with uh, an instructor. Okay, and then finally, um, we'll put in the force, and here there isn't really a sensor. This is actually just um, a voltage signal coming straight in. So I pick up, uh, we've made a custom sensor down here called voltage measurement, serial number one, and um, now we should be away to go. Now, uh, make sure you notice this. Uh, before we can leave here, we need to press F2 to activate the template. So when I, you see that all of these things turn green, so everything's ready to go. All right, the next step um, is to define geometry. We're going to take measurements at a few different points, and so we need to tell um, the program where those are. Now, this might seem like overkill for what we're doing, but um, you know, if you were taking measurements at hundreds of points on an aircraft, you can see how keeping track of where all those points are would be important. Okay, so what we'll need to do is create two points. Um, so we can put them anywhere we want. I'll put one point here and one point here. And that is... Um, and those are the points where we'll, we'll um, attach our sensors. So now we can go to uh, the measurement setup and we can tell the system which transducers are attached to which points. So I'll drag the accelerometer to this point and it's automatically um, placed that in the Y direction. That doesn't really matter for this test, but I'll make them all X just for consistency. Okay, now we can drag the um, second accelerometer to this point. And um, the force comes in at the first degree of freedom as well. And it warns me, yes, you already have a sensor there, but that's okay. I want two of them there. Okay, and um, now away we go. So now we're ready to take measurements. Now we can set up the measurement sequence here, but that's irrelevant since we'll be measuring at all the points at all the time, so we can skip that. And now we're ready to set up the measurement. So what this does is um, you set the sampling in terms of the frequency band that you want to see. So here I set the number of frequency lines and the frequency bandwidth. So uh, 50 hertz is a pretty good setting here. You'll see that that results in a 32 second time record um, with a delta T of 7.8 milliseconds. Um, Okay, and um, the trigger over is okay for now. Um, what this will do is it will free run. Um, so it will always be acquiring any time that the, the measurement is active. It will constantly acquire. It will um, take those um, samples that it acquires, um, take the FFT with a 50, uh, and uh, divide those into blocks with 50% overlap. Take the FFT according to these settings, um, average five times, and then finally give us um, um, an estimate of the transfer function. So this is all okay now. Now we can go and um, to shaker setup and we can um, and we can look at things and um, begin to get set. So um, the, what you see here are these are level meters that show us um, what we're reading from each of the sensors. If I initialize this, um, the data acquisition hardware and this button here, then we should see those become active. And now we see the green lights light up on the three sensors. And um, as the sensors turn on, there will be some built up charge and you'll see that begin to um, drain out. So now we need to tell the software how to, what to do with the shaker. So the shaker is connected to generate the generator one channel. Um, we're going to use a swept sign and um, we can control this how quickly it sweeps. So this is in, um, we can control how many hertz per second it sweeps in. So here you can see that um, we're sweeping um, 
we're sweeping one hertz every two seconds or 0.5 hertz every second. And um, then we need to set the, the lowest frequency and the highest frequency. So here we'll start the sweep at, one hertz, at 0.1 hertz, 100 millihertz, and end at 20 hertz. Um, and so this will set everything. Um, so if we're sweeping approximately 20 hertz um, at half a hertz per second, that's about a four, 40 seconds to sweep up and down. And if you go back to the analysis setup, our, our, we were acquiring data. Each data block was 32 seconds long. So each data block will capture most of the sweep up. Okay, so um, we've initialized. Now we're ready to start and we can see what will happen here. So, um, if you watch the system over there, you can see the shaker has started to move really slowly at first. And then eventually it's going um, more and more quickly. And um, eventually a measurement will pop up over here and we'll see, um, we'll see something in these plots. So right now it says this plot will give us the spectrum, the auto spectrum, and this plot will give us the time. So, um, and if we want to get a better view on these plots, we can always click, uh, left click on the axis and it will auto zoom. So um, you can see what it's um, doing here. Um, so the plots that I'm showing right here are the auto spectrum, the time response. So we finished the first 30 seconds, the second, now this is the third 30 seconds coming up. And you can see one sweep ending and the next sweep just starting at low frequency and then moving on up. All right. Um, and this is the spectrum. Now, depending on which sweep we have, um, will capture a different piece of the spectrum. And after four or five averages, um, we'll, we should have a pretty, pretty good amount of, spect of, um, of input between zero and 20 hertz. And what I'll do though, rather, is I'll just switch this up here to the frequency response. So if I hit the properties of this figure, um, I'll say the function I want to see is the frequency response between um, the first accelerometer and the second. And away we go. And so now um, what, I'll, what we can do is um, just select the functions that we want to see. And um, I'll turn off the fill option so this is easier to see. Okay, so now we can see the two um, transfer functions that we've measured. And um, these don't look too good, so we'll need to do some diagnosis here. There's, um, it looks like there's some kind of a resonance here around 6 hertz, but um, overall this um, doesn't look too nice. So we'll need to work on this. One thing we didn't look at was the level of the signal, but um, we need to set a more reasonable level. If we set about half of a volt or 500 millivolts, um, then that should give us a better level of excitation. The other thing we might think of doing, now that we know that um, nothing interesting really happens above about 15 hertz, we can scale this down. And we could sweep um, even more slowly and try to get a better measurement. And then when we're ready to try again, we hit start, and it will begin acquiring. And you can see the system start to move. And this time we got a lot better motion out of the first mode, at least. Yeah, if you're watching over here now, you can see we're getting quite a bit uh, more motion. So I'll try to steady the web camera here. But now we're getting quite a bit more motion. We should get a better measurement. Also, I didn't talk about this block yet. This is the coherence, which we'll talk about um, in class. This um, basically is a measure of how clean, how good is your measurement? How well do the input and output relate to each other? Okay, so some plots are coming up. I'll auto scale. It, we finished one average and we're starting into the second. So that's everything. All right. And um, the, the only other thing to do now will be to um, export the measurements and you'll have instructions for that in the handout.